Today, my goal is to help all our real estate practitioners stay out of jail. Actually, just stay out of court and maybe not have any fines and things. That's that's what I'm talking about today, Matt Emerson. And in Wanderings In, we are spanning the globe with our special guest, Peace Corps Wanderers. Welcome to Wandering But Not Lost, your online source for finding balance so that you can align, connect, and prosper. I'm living right here and now and I don't want to miss out. Is this what life's all about? The world is calling and I'm listening. Yeah, I'm listening. And now your hosts, Jen O'Brien and Matt Emerson. Welcome to the WBNL Wandering But Not Lost podcast, where real estate and reality meet. It is episode 106. You can find all of our show notes over WBNLpodcast.com. Jan O'Brien, how are we staying out of the hot water today? Well, I do have uh, 10 ways to reduce your liability and risk. They're the same 10 practices I have been teaching for years, but I've updated them for today's world and reprioritized them and made them a little bit more I think valuable, but frankly, none of these 10 have ever changed. It's just the way that you might do some things. Um, So that's what I'm going to talk about today. And I'm very excited about getting to interview my niece and her fiance, who are true, the true epitome of what it means to be wanderers. No kidding. Right? Before we jump into that, though, it is Valentine's Day, which doesn't really mean much to me. It never really has. But happy Valentine's to everybody that might be listening on the day of of uh, publishing today on the 14th. Matt, what about you? You got Valentine's plans. Happy Valentine's Day to you. you. To you as well. I'm actually very fortunate because it's also not only Valentine's Day, but for a lot of schools, it's a four day weekend. So my Valentine is off today, actually. So uh, we're going to probably do something a little this afternoon. Tomorrow, actually, we're going to do a little wandering of ourselves uh, on our own, though. We're going to do some. I was going to do a Zen today on an architect that I have just recently discovered. And we're going to bump it to next week, which is perfect because tomorrow we're going to go actually to visit some of his uh, sites and do a little uh, walk oh, have, around Los Angeles. So I'll have some live pictures and stuff like that. So it'll be cool. You'll have more to talk about. So exactly. that's pretty awesome. All right, cool. And it is yeah, a four-day weekend? Yeah, a four-day weekend because the president's uh, coming up. Yes, 29 years ago today, I proposed to my sweet pea on Catalina Island. Oh. You, you did it on Valentine's Day? How sweet is that? Very so, sweet. so I'm imagining Valentine's Day is a big deal for you too. It is. We don't really do all that much, but it is always fun to look down. <laughs> well, it's a, and, no, yeah. you made it. You made it that way by proposing on Valentine's Day. That's right. That's Absolutely. awesome. Well, very good. You guys are going to enjoy. Some t- it's technically not a four-day weekend, um, but maybe some people are going to do something with that. My, I get to go on Monday uh, to a Vegas Golden Knights game, so that's exciting. That's unusual. I haven't hardly gone this year. It is unusual. <laughs> so I'm very happy to announce how are they, that they, how are the, ducks they, doing? the Ducks, that's funny. Uh, they, they won an exciting game last night beating the the, uh, the NHL uh, Stanley Cup. I can't think of the word. The Stanley Cup champs from last year, the St. Louis Blues, in a very exciting overtime game. So they're, they're hanging in there. It's a very tight race in that division they're in, in the Pacific, the conference they're in. So uh, anyway, more to follow on that. And so honestly, let's jump in and I will talk a little bit about 10 ways to stay out of trouble. You're listening to the Wandering But Not Lost podcast, where real estate and reality meet. Join us and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, and now on YouTube. So welcome back, real estate practitioners. I just want to help you stay out of trouble today. And I hope that these are all cop. These should all be common sense things that I'm going to cover. I'm going to give you ten things that, if you're not doing them, you need to implement them today. Uh, and just from my experience of being a broker over the years, if if everybody did these, we would pretty much reduce our complaints. People are still going to complain. Let me say this: people are going to complain, but if you implement these best practices, then I think you will prevail. Because people will complain about anything. It's like giving a bad review, but if your service and your paperwork and everything backs up that you did everything right and you're going to be fine. So I'm going to start with number one and that's to provide exceptional customer service. Now what I mean by that is communicate, communicate, communicate. That is the biggest complaint of any buyer and seller uh, in all my years of experience is that and then talking as a broker and a client will call up and want to talk to the broker and it's generally about the, the agent not saying a good communication with so you have to talk to your clients. You need to talk to everybody that's in the transaction. And you know what's 
kind of negative in this day and age. There's too nobody picks up the phone anymore, Matt. Everything's done via text. I'm going to get to that in a moment because if you're going to do things by text, you better start backing up your texts and memorializing those texts or having don't delete them because you those could save your butt too. Okay. But it's not the most it's not the most preferred way to to uh, document your transaction is with text. So I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. But it goes without saying you need to provide exceptional customer service. And it's mostly about communication uh, and setting expectations, which is my number two tip. Always conduct a buyer and seller consultation. So before you jump into working with someone, it's so important to sit down, do a formal, not just a presentation where you're talking about you and how great you are and why they should work with you, but to set the expectations of what they should uh, be expecting from you, what you expect from them. How do you want to communicate? What's their preferred method of communication? Right. Walking them through the process. Are they a first time home buyer? Have they done it many times? If they've done it many times in a different state, it could be different in the state that you're working in. So you set that all up front and you do it in a formal presentation. And this is where you can really set the tone for providing exceptional service because you know what you're doing, you're following a, a guide, you're giving them something of value that maybe walks them through like a seller guide or a buyer guide. And right from the get go, you get off to the right step about this is going to be a great experience working with me. Number three is the paperwork is your best defense. I cannot tell you, I could spend hours on this podcast with stories and anecdotes of dealing with complaints at the real estate division, even ethics complaints at GLBR and threats of lawsuits from people when the um, to have basically the complaint get found that there had no merit. So the real estate division would say, you know, if a complaint is filed with the real estate division, they generally send something at the end to say, this complaint has been investigated and the proper action has been taken. And so they don't tell the person what they did, but a lot of times they will find that there is nothing wrong, but you know what can happen? The complaint was about customer service. The complaint was about, I don't like this or that. And then if the paperwork is messed up, that's where an agent might get a fine. So if somebody complains about X has nothing to do with what the eventual fine is because you don't have a duties owed or an agency disclosure sign. So your paperwork, your paperwork is your best defense. So thank you very much to all the transaction coordinators out there and all the compliance people in our companies that all of you hate sometimes. If you're a real estate agent, you're like, oh, my God, that compliance person is so picky. Or my you need to say thank you very much because yeah. every time they tell you that you forgot a signature or you did this, just think about what that could do to save you later if and when there is a complaint. Now, I hate I am an optimistic person. I'm a realist more. I used to be way more optimistic. I'm certainly not a pessimist. So I'm somewhere in between. I don't know about you, Matt. Do uh, you feel I'm Pollyanna, you know me. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the deal. I hate to think this whole talk today is about preparing for the worst, meaning you, you think about everything in a transaction I do as a broker, what could get you in trouble. So I'm having you, I don't want you to think like everything's going to go south, but if you don't have to worry about it, if you follow these practices, is my right. point. So the paperwork, the clean paperwork, having a, a complete file of all your disclosures and forms and texts and emails. So when I say just paperwork, I also mean your email correspondence. So make sure that you are keeping a folder of all your emails. In fact, what I think you need to do is if you're smart, you have listings and then you have one, two, three Elm street. And then you have, you put all your emails into that folder. And then at the end of the transaction, print them out or save them as a PDF and upload it into your paperless transaction management system. Now your company has to maintain files. Your broker has to maintain files in the state of Nevada. It's for five years. But here's the thing. You may change companies. You, you may, something could happen to the, to the software or whatever. I've seen it happen. So ah! yeah, yes, so the, we, have. we have. So the bottom line is you need to keep your own digital copy of all of your paper. Now, long ago, everybody had boxes of files. There's no need for that anymore. You shouldn't even have a paper file but you need to have a backup to your backup. So make sure it's got your text and your email correspondence and, and all that great stuff. So paperwork is your best defense. My next one is the rule of three. The rule of three. The rule of three simply sent, says, recommend three of everything, three home warranty companies, even three lenders. Let the buyers choose uh, three home inspection companies. And the easiest way to be able to prove, again, I'm, I got you thinking about I'm in court, how do I prove? Because this is what happens. With, it's not just court. It's, it's in a real estate division complaint. People will be like, 
Jan, my agent Jan said I should use that home inspection company. But if you have a piece of paper that says it's signed by them and you can show it and it says, no, my standard practice is to give this document that has three home inspectors, three home warranty companies, three repair guys or whatever, and it has, hey, here are three companies that I've worked with um, that I recommend, but it's, you know, and it has a disclosure about it's up to you to go vet out and choose your own. You need something like that because then even your court. Aware. It is that, but it's basically, uh, but what we know is everybody goes, I'll get my handyman to do that for you, or uh, you need to use this person for that. So the rule of three and back it up with a piece of paper. Because what, what happens is everyone is just talking about it. Then it becomes, he said, she said, there's no written documentation about what really happened. And honestly, people, in any kind of conversation, in any kind of issue, there's what I think, what you think, and then what really happened, right? In any kind of dispute. So that's that one. Um, next, it's get a home warranty and home inspection. Now, man, this one I must I talk about every day and to the point that we've incorporated something into our company that when I want three documents, if somebody chooses to not get a home inspection and or waive a uh, home warranty, it's in the contract where they can waive it. That's awesome. But sometimes people say they want to do it and then they change their mind. This is so important. This is probably one of the most important things that you have proof that you told them not once, not twice, but three times how important it was to get a home inspection. I think you need to use three pieces of paper. So there's a generally all companies, all states have a waiver of a home warranty or home inspection or it's incorporated into a buyer disclosure form. I think you need to have your own form that you maybe even have them sign off on. Then I definitely think for inspections, you always use the for your protection, get a home inspection form. I want to see three, at least two, three is better. Because again, I always put myself in court or before the real estate division or talking to the attorneys to say, well, Mike, the, you know, the attorney, the buyer's client is saying, the buyer's attorney is saying, well, you know, the my client is saying that your agent told them they didn't need a home warranty or they didn't need a home inspection. And I'm like, really? Is this your client's signature three times where my agent told them three times and had them sign something three times about how important it is to get a home inspection and a home warranty? That one right there is going to save your butt. Many people will waive the warranty or the inspection sometimes. Not too much inspections, but warranties sometimes. I see that too. There's a broker. I'll get a call and it's a complaint from someone saying, I just bought a house in your agent, this and that, and I might have big plumbing issues and they want you, me to fix it for them. And the very first question I'll ask them after I empathize with them, of course, what I really want to say is congratulations, you're a home owner now, but I don't do that. But I, what I really want to, what I do say is um, I'm assuming you have a home warranty and you've got a home inspection, right? And I'm hoping before I make that call, I'm checking my file, my agent's file to make sure. And I need to know what's happening because I'm hoping that's the, the case. So that one's going to save you big time. Uh, I think this is now number six. Yeah, six, disclose, don't diagnose. You are not an inspector. You are not a real estate attorney. You're not a tax consultant. Do not start telling people about what they can save taxes on or if this is a good investment or not. You need to be the source of the source. So it provide a resource document that has links to where they can go find everything out from zoning to what are the crime stats and so on. You stay in your lane, stay in your lane. You're a real estate practitioner. You're not all those other things. And so you're disclosing when you discover something, you're not diagnosing, you're not giving them advice. It's outside of your area of expertise. But even things as simple as square footage. Be careful of that one too, because you never really know. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, keep a communication log, uh, record your notes, your conversations and milestones. So, uh, this is, I, I talked to it a little bit about paperwork, backing up in paperwork, but it is important when, especially if you start to have any red flags start to pop up or problems start happening in a transaction, I think it's so important to start right now going, I better start documenting everything. So you get off the phone and this is where a great CRM comes into place. You can keep your notes in there because trust me, you cannot remember everything that goes on and when it happened and you don't have to go too overboard with it, but you need to use your common sense. If you're in the middle of, uh, of having a dispute on something in the middle of a transaction, start uh, writing down, this is what happened. So the biggest piece to this is take your verbal conversations you have with the other agent, with the client, reduce it to an email. So if Matt's my client and I'm going to say, Matt, per our conversation today, 
this you decided that you wanted to have me and you know and then you just kind of repeat whatever the scenario is so there is no confusion because sometimes we were communicating sure i think i heard my client matt tell me something but matt was actually saying something else so i can clear that up in an email and now i have a paper trail to say you instructed me to do this or you know this is the direction you you are okay with accepting that as uh, the solution for um, repairs on the home and so on, right? And you know, if so, you set the if you if you set that up as the expectation up front, and you're actually following through with the communication methods you talked about, they'll really respect that. So it'll make your it'll prove that your value even more to them as you go through the transaction. Um, so the next one is is a li just slightly different. So that's more about keeping a communication log of the milestones and the things that happen. Um, uh, the, the next one here is number seven. The no, seven. Yes. Wait. Seven, yeah, you were on seven. Eight. I was on seven, so this would be eight. Eight. I'm on eight now. So I'm saying use email to confirm um, texts and other things. But what I mean here is you need to be able to – when I wrote this one years ago, we were still doing paper transactions. But I still think it's important to talk about documenting um, using email to back up that you have delivered. You're not always going to do transactions paperlessly. Not everybody's good with it. But the cool part about this is that nowadays we can have proof that we delivered all copies of the contracts. I've seen people get in trouble and get fines for a client saying, I never got a copy of the contract yeah. that I signed. So even with paperless transaction management, you've got to be able to prove that you sent them the documents. So you have a log in your transaction management system. But if you do you have proof of, of delivering anything else that didn't go through your paperless transaction stuff. So be clear that, that you can prove in a court of law that they got everything you're supposed to give them. Okay. Uh, number nine is to implement a listing and sale checklist or workflow. There are too many moving parts in a real estate transaction. I unfortunately find most real estate agents keep it up here in their head and that's how balls get dropped. Things get gotcha. missed. So you've got to use a thing that starts from beginning to end. We do it for all our new agents, but I find seasoned agents aren't using it. They're just going with the flow of what they know to do and what's next. But for honestly, a checklist that you check off in time date can be, can be supported and you can upload it as part of any kind of documentation you might need in a future uh, complaint or a scenario where you can say, no, I delivered this, I did this, they got this disclosure, we, you know, all the way down. So it's also part of your customer service. So it's, it's milestones, tasks, due diligence dates, but it's also, are you doing things to do great customer service? Uh, and another example of great customer service during the transaction is to use an automated system like your CRM to say, congratulations, we've opened up escrow. Here's what's going to happen next. And then another email goes out to say, here's a copy of the escrow instructions. And then another email, here's a reminder, you know, need to go get your hazard insurance. These are all things that you can do to automate through your CRM that totally creates a wow experience for the client. And you're not just winging it and behind the, you know, you're always behind on, uh, on things and so forth. All right. So that's number nine. And no, number 10, Last thing, use standard practices with everyone. And this goes to fair housing. Mm. Um, this is the deal where you treat everybody the same, fairly and equally. And so a great example of this is if you decide you want to have safety practices in place for yourself, which I think is a great idea. So if you want to, if you don't know someone and you're taking them out um, and you decide that I'm going to have a practice of meeting people at my office, giving a showing itinerary to my front desk, or my manager, and maybe getting some form of, identi of identification from the person I don't know, then you better do that with everybody you work with, even yeah. people you know, because that immediately is setting you up for you're discriminating, you're not treating people fairly because you have a feeling or you have a concern about that person that you don't know. So uh, that one is a common sense one, but uh, that's fair housing and you don't want to mess with HUD and $10,000 fines. No, that's a good tip. And by the way, most of these other things that I've talked about besides customer service, if paperwork missing here in Nevada, they can find up to $10,000 per occurrence for things that are required, like providing copies of documents to your client, yeah. um, you know, uh, so forth. Okay. So, uh, that are those are my ten strategies, my ten best practices that I hope you're all doing anyway. But maybe you learned one or two that you could be doing to tighten it up. And if you're new to the business, this is the way you need to start right now from day one. So you will never. I'm not saying you won't get in trouble, but you know what? If you do these things, the chances are that you will prevail in any kind of complaint or 
intentional. Yeah, and getting back to what you were talking about, your TC being your your uh, right. lifesaver out there, your your you know, <laughs> it's going to save you in the absolutely. So I think today, not only should it be Valentine's Day, I think it should be go out and buy your TC a five dollar gift card to Starbucks. There you go. Some sort of some sort of thank you for keeping you out of court. Absolutely. Come take my hand and see the world around you. The time is right, just let the lights surround you. And step by step, you feel it coming alive. The feeling deep down inside. The best memories are made when you take the road less traveled. Visit wanderingbutnotlost.com for some inspiration. Today on Wanderings In, we have some very special guests in the Wandering But Not Lost podcast studio, world travelers, looking forward to hearing more about their adventures. Jana Bryan, why don't you set this up? Absolutely. Well, I'm very happy to have my niece and her fiance. This is Kaylee and Perry uh, make a little stop here in Henderson, Nevada, on their way to Zion National Park and surroundings for it's actually a celebration weekend for Kaylee's birthday. Perry surprised her for her birthday. Sweet. Um, so just to set, the, set it up a little bit, they're currently both working for the Peace Corps in Washington, D.C., but welcome to the podcast, guys. I want to start with Git because I just I told Matt and I've told you guys too that if I was to ever live my life over again, it would be your lives. I'm just going to say that. We're true wanderers at heart. And uh, why don't you start with just how you actually met? Because that was an adventure in itself, and the adventure has continues and continues today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see about seven years ago uh in june 2013 kaylee was at georgia southern university and i was at kennesaw state so both in georgia but uh about four hours apart we didn't know each other at all um and we had both signed up for a study abroad to italy and because kaylee's last name was walker and my last name's watkins we ended up sitting right next to each other on the airplane and talked for nine hours straight. Um, and the rest is history. So <laughs> it all the the W's that you know each other. <laughs> awesome. So for the next six weeks, we enjoyed uh, the hills of Tuscany and, and some, some nice glasses of wine and an art class and some other classes. And, and here we are today. Yeah. Engaged and about to be married wow. today. So in between that, you guys were in Italy, and then what was the next big thing? Did you guys do something in Spain, or, or I can't remember the story now. Was was Perry yeah. in Spain, and then you got to go uh, work abroad or study? Yeah. yeah. So we came back. Uh, Perry had one more year in school, and then um, he graduated. I had transferred back to Kennesaw because I knew I wanted to um, go and study in Spain. Um, so I came back home, Perry uh, graduated and signed up for the teaching English position in Spain for one year. And so he graduated, moved off to Spain. And then five months later in December, I moved to Spain. Um, I live outside of Madrid and went to an international school for six months. And Perry was teaching English in a small mountain town called Cuenca. Um, and so that was our next kind of step from there. We, and we did a lot of our travels during that uh, six months to a year around Europe. Um, and what kind of places did you visit when you were there? And it was nice just to throw this in there because I only worked three days a week and Kaylee only was studying three days a week. Yeah. So four days a week, we had off to travel all the time. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah, it was great. Um, but gosh, places we went to, yeah. we did, we, we, of course, we made it back to Italy together. Oh, we nice. went to, uh, Lake Como for Valentine's Day while we were over there. Uh, Happy Valentine's Day. Yeah, everybody. that's awesome. Happy, yeah, Valentine's. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Um, we made it to Germany, to Greece, to France, um, Belgium. to Belgium. Gosh, we're a ton of tons of different places yeah. in Spain, of course. Um, what to were some of your favorite places? What would you name as a couple, one or two spots just in Europe? Because you certainly went, we're going to talk in a minute about going to a whole other area of the world, but sure. what, what are highlights in Europe? I think... For me, um, Greece was one of my favorites because I think, I mean, everyone talks about the islands and everything, but we like to walk around kind of like the city areas. Um, and so the small parts of, uh, what's that, what's the city outside that you take the um, uh, boat to the island, to San Trini? Yeah, so we would, there's a city that you go and take all of the boats to those islands. So we would go around, have a lot of those euros, and, and like we like to just wander around the city and kind of not have a plan and figure it out ourselves. Yes. True um, wandering, man. That is the yeah. best way, always. Yeah. And so from there, we went to Santorini um, and we rented an ATV 
and just use that to get around the island the whole yeah. time oh. and, and figured out little small kind of patches of um, rocky beaches that aren't really touristy. So that was one of my favorites because we went in the off season as well. So it wasn't super touristy, which yeah. in my opinion would be one of the best times to go because people, you see everyone kind of like getting ready for the tourist season and the locals out there. Um, you just get to see a different side of it in that non-touristy season. When you were traveling through Europe, did you travel by car? Did you do train, bus? I mean, what was your mode of transportation to kind of to get around? It just depended. When yeah. we were when we were going country to country, we typically flew because um, oh, yeah. Time. Ryanair um, is like the cheapest airline that exists. I think the most we spent on a round trip flight was to Germany. And that was like seventy five dollars. Mm -hmm. um, wow! Well, yeah, but usually it would be roughly like thirty dollars. Thirty bucks or yeah. so for a round trip flight. Now, while we were in Spain, we always took the buses and the trains. Right. Such good public transportation. Yeah, yeah I've, I, it's been years since I've been in Europe, but the, yeah, you can get around so easily there. It's, that's mm -hmm. why I asked that question. So okay, cool. So, Perry, you're fluent, you're fluent in Spanish, yeah. obviously. Now, Kaylee, you have learned Spanish in the interim. Um, well, before we move on to your next uh, experiences outside, sorry about that, uh, of Europe, um, was there something that you like to highlight in Europe, Perry? For well, I was just going to continue a little bit just about transportation. There oh, was yeah, please. And going off of learning Spanish. So there's this, this form of transportation in Spain. It's basically car sharing. It's called Blah Blah Car. And so it's a website and an application that you can download. But basically, you, you get on there and you type in where you're going. And you can find folks who are advertising that they're driving that route and they've got room for X amount of passengers and it's always oh. free. Um, but it was a great way to get around Spain to meet locals and to practice Spanish because most of the time the folks didn't speak or just didn't want to speak any English, even if they did. Um, so you got in the car with someone random, drove somewhere and spoke Spanish the whole time. Um, wow. That was, that was really fun. <laughs> Total that's immersion. Cool. Yeah, look, wait, look, so most, some local color. That's Matt, awesome. Yeah. Most people, most people travel for traveling, but these two are an example of immersion into the culture yeah, from okay. from the studying and working to what was next. How did you guys get to Italy? Because I know Italy became another. Uh, no, you started in Italy. You went to Spain. Yeah. It was Thailand that was yeah, next, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we, after Spain, we had a, a month where we just backpacked around Asia. Oh, yeah. Hello. Um, and just kind of uh, discovered different parts of uh, Thailand, Cambodia. Um, and from there, we came back home, and I had a semester left at school. So we had decided that we wanted to really go back to Asia and live there for at least a year. So we found another organization called... Um, E-I-E-E, -E, and you can just apply. They have different um, six month or one year English teaching positions. They have some in Europe as well, but we had just been there for about six months. So we decided to sign up to Thailand. Um, and then they place you at a, a government school um, in some part of Thailand as English teachers, but in Perry's case, they placed him as a math teacher. <laughs> no background in math whatsoever. Yeah, uh, so we just went with it. That's um, awesome. Yeah, so I graduated and we moved um, uh, to Thailand, but before then we took a month to do the Camino de Santiago. So that's- Oh my God, you gotta talk about that experience wow. because I was living it with you and thinking, oh my goodness, this has got to be yeah. major. Cause a whole month of traveling on that, on that road. Do you know about that, Matt? Are you yeah, yeah, you, you told me about it. Oh Absolutely. yeah, right on. Okay, go yeah. ahead guys, tell Gary us more. Told me about it cause he met um, a guy who- A German guy in Morocco who yeah. told me about it. Yeah, <laughs> so we were like, we have to do this. Um, but yeah, I'm loving that already. Hey, met this German guy in Morocco, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good life. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he was in, he stood out immediately because he had decided to walk from the airport in Morocco all the way to Tangier, which is not an easy walk. And so, meeting him in the hostel, we'd seen him on the side of the road, and we were just like, What are you doing out there? And so, he went into this whole spiel about he just wanted to keep walking everywhere because he just finished the Camino de Santiago. Um, so yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's so, awesome. like, yeah. inspiration there for sure. Full yeah. circle how we planned it. Um, so we took a month before we were to start our English teaching in Thailand, um, and started in Saint Jean de Deport in France, um, and that's in a small mountain town in France. We took some buses from Madrid all the way up there, and the next day began um, our trek, and from France all the way to the end. Of, um, to Santiago and that's the like traditional route um, is from France to Santiago but and that's about 300 miles yeah 
And so then from there, you can go to Finisterre, which is three more days of walking. And that's literally the very end, like you hit the coast. Mm -hmm. um, and that was more of the traditional route where people would go all the way to the very end. Um, what's the story See, they would? Well, so before it was the Camino de Santiago, it was uh, a trail that Druids would actually walk yeah. on. Um, mm -hmm. Folks, you know, very <laughs> a very, very long time ago, um, before Christianity even existed, um, and they would walk this this trail as sort of a cleansing new beginning type of, of mindset or idea. Um, they'd get to the they'd walk all the way across Spain, all the way across the north of Spain to the coast. They would burn their clothes um, and spend the entire night in the ocean. And then it's kind of a rebirth when the sun was coming back up the next day. Um, they would continue on their route all the way back home. Yeah. Wow. Um, it was kind of a way to just leave all of the the bad or the negative, the the challenges from the past year um, there in the ocean, and then begin. Fresh know, yeah. for the next. Sounds year. like we could all use that hike right about now. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of what we did. Um, well, with all the clothes burning. Right. Probably, yeah. yeah, we didn't do that. Well, maybe. Not. Was yeah. it an amazing experience? I mean, was it? I mean, you were how many? How many? Sometimes, how many miles were you walking a day? So it depended. Um, you start out. You, you, you. We really had to learn, especially with our American mindset. It wasn't a race. Yes. It wasn't a competition. Mm -hmm. um, and you really have to learn to listen to your body. So I think we started out pretty ambitious. We started out immediately walking about 18 miles a day yeah. um, and walking at a pretty good pace. And then we both started really hurting. We got injury. And there was one night I remember when both of our legs were hurting really badly in places where they never hurt before. And there was this Dutch doctor that was staying. You stay in these big, huge rooms full of bunk beds that are only open to folks that are walking the community of Santiago. So mm. from around the world. Um, and we were spending the night right next to this, this Dutch couple. And the guy just happened to be a doctor and he started, he just kind of said, let me see your legs and feet. And so he just kind of started massaging around on our yeah. legs and feet and could actually feel where they were swollen and basically just told us that we really needed to listen to our bodies and to slow down a little bit. So after that, we kind of, we got more in the rhythm of listening to our bodies and doing what we actually were supposed to be doing, um, you know, learning our limits. But there was days that we go, like, I guess, a minimum of about 10 to 12 miles. And then there was days farther on in the Camino, once we got really acclimated, when we do upwards of 26 to, to wow. 30 miles. Yeah, that's so, amazing. So, on the day. Yeah. Jenna Bryan, we would not keep that pace if you uh, and I know, were on that. But maybe when we're in our 20s, we could do it. Um, <laughs> oh, so, that's it. So, guys, all right. So, you got, you've now, you do your, your trip, your time in Thailand, which is, was amazing. I know you guys got to travel and do so many things there. Mm -hmm. But for the sake of time and everything, for two, I want to make sure we get to the story mm -hmm. of how I want to be able to talk about how you got to the Peace Corps. And then I definitely want to get Matt, uh, our wandering master here, to give you his best tips for Zion before we close today, because that'll be a good segment as well. Yeah, so, how'd you end up getting to the Peace Corps? Because that is like you've learned, a lot, we've learned along with you and the family yeah. anyway. What a process. How many people want to be part of the Peace Corps? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, we had uh, talked about it that we wanted to do the Peace Corps even before we met each other. I think we both had it in mind. Um, but we, it's this two year program where you apply and you can now apply as a couple before in the past, you had to be married to serve together. Um, mm -hmm. but now they have it where you can apply as a couple. Um, you just have to have been together for at least like a year. Um, and, uh, so we did that. We applied while we were in Thailand, um, cause we knew that was like our, our next experience that we wanted to really tackle and fully immerse ourselves. Um, so we applied online, just put that we were interested in going anywhere. Um, and we got placed for Panama. So we went through the interview process, got accepted. There's a whole medical and legal process as well to go through to be completely cleared. Um, but then we only had about three months after Thailand and before we left for Panama. So we took that time to just see family um, hang out with friends, and then we left for Panama in February of 2018. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so we went through this rigorous training process. That's how I really started learning my Spanish in the beginning. Um, and then we got placed in a small mountain town. A thousand people. Yeah, a thousand <laughs> people. Um, and we were both English teachers. So Perry was an English teacher at an elementary school, and I was at a high school. Um, and we were the only two foreigners in that town. Wow. And that was my, I would say, my true immersive experience. I think that was a main goal for Perry and I. We had had all these traveling experiences before, but to feel like we were really a part of a community, we mm -hmm. got that with Peace Corps, and we left feeling like we had family there. So if you want yeah. to add on that. Although we were, we technically had positions, we were both English teachers <clears throat> in the Peace yeah. Corps. 
our main goal there was to build a community and to, to build relationships, make lasting friendships. Um, so the way it works is that you live with a host family for a bit of your time there as well. Um, so we started out with a host family. There was one point where we were sharing a room with about nine brothers and sisters um, and uncle and grandpa. Um, so what better way to get closer with folks than really living <laughs> with them like that? Um, and once we moved out to our own place, we lived, we found a little home there to rent from uh, a neighbor. Um, and we continued going over to our host family's house for dinners uh, many times a week. And our host mom worked at Kaylee School, so yeah. we got to see her all the time anyway. Um, but no, about three hours a day, almost every afternoon, we would just, we'd finish our, our work at school, come home, take a break, and then we would just walk around the community. Um, so again, just wandering around the community and we would just, in, in Panama, it's a very much so an open door policy. So every time you're home, you have your front door open. Most of the time you're not even inside, you're hanging out on the porch, talking to your neighbors. So we would just walk around and just talk to folks and everyone was so welcoming. Everyone would just wave us to come over and be so eager to talk to us. Um, there was never a day we ever could have possibly gone hungry in Panama because yeah, everyone you food all the time. Food. Very good coffee in Panama. So cheers to that. Um, and no, I mean, it was just beautiful. The, the mountains, there was, we were walking distance from about three different rivers with amazing swimming holes, waterfalls. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of agriculture. We got to work a bit with farmers as well. Wow. It was an absolutely amazing experience. Well, I'll tell you what, guys, as we uh, need to wrap up, I we we'd love to have you come back and talk about some more things. There's tons of questions I still have. Matt, you haven't even gotten to some of your questions. And we're going to edit next and so on. But we've got like two minutes left. What would you give them as your best tips on a February trip to Zion National well, Park? That's the that's the the ticket right there. It's February. You just don't know what the weather's going to be like. So yeah. I tell you, go to the visitor center and talk to the rangers because if yeah. the, they will know what the heck is going on, and especially yeah. about Angels Landing. And there's yeah. a couple great hikes from the valley floor out of the valley, but mm -hmm. those once again, you just never know. But yeah. take advantage of the stuff that's right down in the valley itself. Like all the way at the end of the road mm -hmm. uh, is the uh, River Walk, and that takes you down to where yeah. the Narrows Walk actually yeah. starts yeah. happening. It's a it's they're all easy hikes in the valley, but they're beautiful, beautiful hikes mm -hmm. especially this time of the year when all the leaves are off the tree yeah. the river walk we've been on it one time where it was so icy the ice had formed on side of the rocks it, I mean, it was it was a magic it was like it was like going to uh, inside frozen or <laughs> superman's ice crystal palace yeah. i mean it was the coolest thing and you wouldn't expect that on you know that little walk like that yeah. you know the emerald pools weeping rock the court of the patriarchs all of those those hikes right there in the valley are beautiful mm -hmm. but angel's landing cannot be beat here's the thing about that it, it, it does get kind of treacherous like mm -hmm. i had mentioned yeah. we tried that hike three separate times we only made it once because we had weather conditions both times one time yeah. it, it thunderstorms the other time slip really slippery i mean we were mm -hmm. we were like you had already mentioned earlier like we were gonna do it and we yeah. got to a point where like you know what this is yeah. like well, here we are here we are up here on the top in one second we could be laying on the valley floor so maybe <laughs> that's not the wisest thing but you know what I, have you been you've been to Zion before or no? No. no. First oh, okay. The, uh, here's the thing I love about Zion. It is the most spiritual park I have ever been in. And talk about just feeling like there is a presence around you at all times. That park does it. It is mm -hmm. absolutely gorgeous. So mm -hmm. where are you staying? Are you staying? In the park or in Orderville in a shipping container, yeah, actually. It's been, ah. it's been converted <laughs> into I'm gonna get a picture so we can post it so you can that, see it. That is uh, awesome. Yeah. You're gonna have to send us pictures if you have them from your other yeah. travels too, so we can post them on our, our I'll get, site. I'll because... get them to send some pictures. But guys, listen, thank you so much for taking yeah. time to talk to us before you get on another adventure. And honestly, we don't have to tell these guys be forever wandering, but not long. No right kidding. No All kidding. Right. We love you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you for design. Have fun. Right. Will right. do. Okay. Thank you. You're listening to the Wandering But Not Lost podcast, where real estate and reality meet. Join us and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, and now on YouTube. Well, that's a wrap for another WBNL Wandering But Not Lost podcast where real estate and reality meet. It was episode 106. All of our show notes over WBNLpodcast.com. John and Brian, those were good tips for staying out of court uh, by using common sense practices. I was really fortunate when I was selling real estate. I never had any problems with uh, anything that came up, but I know a lot of people that have, not by their fault. And the people that prevailed in those were the people that always had their ducks in a row and their paperwork uh, and uh, uh, you know their, their common... Uh, uh, practices consistent so those are really good tips and oh my god 
I want to wander like those guys wander. That was a great segment. I can't wait to talk to those guys again. I'm looking forward to seeing what kind of awesome time they had in Zion. Just, just you could just tell just by listening to them that they are completely enveloped in what they do, and that, you know, it's just really an awesome story. You know, in the pre-podcast setup, but while I uh, they, there's some town on the way to Zion, as they said, um, I was like, guys, we can talk to you about three or four times. There's so much. We, they didn't get to so many other things they've done. They've traveled to India. They've had some. They've had a really close experience with a, a catastrophe that happened in Thailand that wow. they could talk about. And they have visited national parks, park national parks that are, that are in our European sure. uh, parks and so forth that they've traveled because they're very much about getting up and getting out and wandering. So I told them we'll have them back and we'd love to get their yeah, adventures. Yeah, there are foreign foreign correspondents. There are foreign. Co- She's a, Kaylee's a blogger. They both journal. They've got just great experiences and they're. You know, they're like 27, uh, I think she's about to turn 27, 27, 28 years old. Can you imagine they've been doing all that in their 20s? Yeah, it's awesome. Lots of time to do it. All right. Great stuff. So everybody have a happy Valentine's Day and have a great, uh, if you're listening at the time of this, uh, enjoy your President's Day weekend. And we'll catch you on the next episode of Wandering But Not Lost. That's right. Get up, get out. Take the road less traveled and be forever wandering but not lost. <laughs>